Welcome to Adventures in Producing. This is an interview series with amazing producers, film and TV, uh, mostly film. And for now, I'm talking to amazing female producers because I want to champion some amazing women in this industry. My name is Wendy Mitchell. I am a film journalist and a film festival consultant. And I've always admired the work that producers do. And I just don't think they get quite enough credit in the industry. So let's go behind the curtain and find out what producers really do. Um, I've been trying to get today's interviewee for a little while. She's always so busy being a powerhouse, um, but I'm thrilled to say we are welcoming Kate Pansagrau. She is a producer and casting director that has worked in South Africa and Brazil. She is alumnus of Durban Talents, Berlinale Talents, Durban Film Mart, La Fabrique, uh, Iava Producers Workshop. I first met her, I think, um, as part of the Rotterdam family, because she was always in Rotterdam pitching cool stuff and showing amazing films. She associate produced Necktie Youth and then has produced four features since then. The Wound, Luna, The Tree, This Is Not a Burial, It's a Resurrection. The latter won more than 30 festival awards, just such an amazing piece of cinema including a jury prize at Sundance. It was Lesotho's first ever Oscar submission. And I ran into her in Berlin, 2023, where she had the short Mirror Mirror. Kate is the co-owner of Aruku Media with Elias Ribeiro, and they also run training through Realness Institute. She's got a lot going on. I'm so thrilled you're here. Um, Kate, so let's start. Where did you grow up? Did you grow up in South Africa or where did you? Where I did. did. And let me just say, Wendy, like super pumped to be here. Thank you so much for the for the invitation and the wonderful introduction. I did grow up in South Africa in a very, very small conservative town uh, called Howick in the middle of nowhere. Um, and yeah, I could not wait to get out basically as soon as I- I was gonna I say, just seeing you today, we are aware <laughs> you might not be the best fit for a small conservative town for the rest of your life. Yes, you don't say. No, it was like literally I bought my driving license. Like I, I like bribed the instructor. And as soon as I got my, <laughs> as soon as I graduated high school, I literally drove away um, and drove to, to Cape Town where I attended film school. And I do I do go back to visit the small town. My grandmother still lives there and my mother still lives there. So I do go on occasion, but so happy I don't live there anymore, I must say. And then how did you get your start in the film business? Did you study? Did you just start working as a runner? What happened? Yeah. So I always knew from little um, that I was going to work in film. I didn't quite understand the mechanics of it. You know, I didn't understand the roles necessarily, but I just knew that I was going to work in the movies. And so as I got older um, and started researching film schools, I also had a cousin who uh, was a cinematographer who had studied cinematographer at the school I was interested in, which happened to be in Cape Town, which also happened to be the place I wanted to live. So it all sort of, you know, organically came together. And I studied a uh, Bachelor of Arts, a uh, majoring in producing, um, yeah, a long time ago. And then um, knew that I kind of graduated feeling very ill-equipped actually, like didn't know how to get a job. I knew how to make short films really well. Um, my student work had won quite a few prizes, but I had no idea how to get a job and I had no idea the scope of what was available to me. And so I knew that I wanted to make a, a lot more shorts. I wanted to make music videos, etc. Obviously wanted to make uh, feature films, but I'm a bit of a realist, you know, so um, I knew I would have to make myself financially comfortable and stable, comfortable, I wasn't really ever comfortable, but, you know, stable enough to work on my own projects on the side. And so the fastest way to do that was to work in the international service industry in Cape Town, which is a massive part of our film industry, servicing uh, long form uh, projects, series and features, as well as um, commercials. And so I got my start in international commercials 
um, completely bullshit my way through my first interview. And so I was never a runner. I started as a production coordinator, not knowing what was going on, um, but somehow managed to climb the ranks in production. And that's also where I discovered casting, which was just an absolute godsend to me because production was slowly killing my soul. Like I could not deal with just being a cog in the service wheel, never mind the cog in the wheel. It's like, you know, you have no ownership or, or creative contribution to the work at all. And so casting really changed things for me. I love that you did casting. because These are also unsung heroes that can have such an impact on the industry and and just championing new talents and things like this. So, how, you know, how long did you work as a casting director and how do you think that background helps you now in producing? Yeah, I mean, what I loved about casting at the time, other than the fact that it took me away from production, to be clear, I cast and then I would work in production on the same jobs that I did. And I really loved the sense of being there. Not, I wasn't there till the end, of course, but in the beginning, working with the director on the creative brief. And this is, you know, I was 21 years old at the time. It's kind of wild when I think back to, I'm working with major commercial directors bringing my own outlandish ideas to the casting brief. I was known for street casting and for discovery casting. And so um, I did that. I worked in commercials for five years, all the while doing my own thing on the side where I could. I made a couple of shorts, music videos, etc. Tried to develop a few features, but very quickly realized that ain't a part-time thing. Um, so, and then casting in long form, it kind of came organically through the wound, actually. So um, I met John and Elias um, at, a, at a market where um, they were taking meetings for the wound. It was still very early development. And I saw one of their pitches and I was like, whatever happens, I need to be involved in this project. And so I went up to them and I was like, I grew up in the Eastern Cape, which is where the, the film is set, which was a lie. I spent some time there as a child. Um, and I was like, I know the, the ritual really well. And, you know, I can like get you in with the local people. And and so they approached me to to cast it or at least to cast part of it, like the bit parts, etc. Um, but then as things do development, you know, went in other ways and so on. And they ended up getting hold of me six months after that to say, okay, we want you to, to really lead the casting in between. We'd had a few conversations. Um, and so they had, I'd slowly sort of gotten them to fall in love with me and, um, and the wound casting, the wound was one of the most significant experiences of my life because I worked very closely with John Trengo of the writer director and we came up with a few rules for ourselves in terms of how we were going to go about the casting and the kind of people that we wanted to cast and I was really interested in mixing real people with with trained actors which John was totally um, down for as well and so over the course of almost two years I put about 500 men on tape by myself. This was going around the country, inviting them either to my house or my Airbnb and having my approach to the casting was really to get a sense of who they were rather than like, here are the lines, read the lines um, because mostly they were not actors. So that wouldn't have worked in any case. And I built really strong relationships through meeting these people in this way and having them tell me the most intimate things about something that you are not supposed to talk about. And I think the fact that I'm white and female, I couldn't be more removed from, from the ritual we were depicting. That there was maybe some kind of safety that they felt in telling me this. Um, and so when we did finalize the cast over two years later, I had been in talks with Elias over this time and, you know, I'd, we had talked about sort of me coming on board in, a, in a, some kind of production uh, capacity and John had wanted me involved in the shoot to be because I had built this very unique relationship with the cast um, and it, they, he was going to have to ask him to do some very difficult things emotionally and to access some very difficult things emotionally for performance so 
that's how I kind of ended up on the wound and then ended up taking a much larger role in terms of producer. Elias is, is not a producer that visits set um, or is likes being on set. And so John and I worked very closely in that regard. And I were I lived with the cast. So I lived with 20 boys under the age of like 21 um for four weeks sharing one bathroom it was rough um because that, we were i mean that is the <laughs> most shocking production story i've ever heard one bathroom we were living in this old like dilapidated ex like it, it was called the piggery like they used to breed like grow pigs in there um and it was converted into a house but it really didn't have quite all the bells and whistles so yeah that was quite an experience um and I became the safe haven for the cast. So anytime they need, like I was there to advocate for them to John if they weren't entirely comfortable. Um, whereas the more mature cast, the main cast, um, especially lived quite isolated away from everyone else and by themselves. It was a decision that the actors made together with John to have that living arrangement. Um, and what was fascinating is that the dynamic in the house very closely resembled what was going on with the characters on set and so it worked out really well but my god i'm not i'm not in a rush to go and live with like young dudes again with one bathroom in the bush it was it was a tall ask actually john owes me majorly for that one that is terrifying and inspiring and one of the many reasons i could never be a film producer um I'm, I'm kind of, this is nosy, but you know, you're spending years getting these tapes and bonding with 400 people or were you being paid properly for that? Or it was kind of out of a labor of love. You, I mean, I don't imagine this film had a huge budget for to pay you a full salary to do that for years. Certainly not, no, but I mean, I was paid in a way that, you know, my time was honored, but it was really, an honorarium it's nowhere close to, to real fees but like i said when i first heard this project talked about i said whatever happens i have to be on this i just like knew it in my gut and so and fortunately i had built up the safety net through years of, of commercials mm -hmm. that i could afford to to take that time and you know it wasn't two years full time obviously no. i was little things happening in between, but um, I, I would do it again. It was, a, and I did get to do it again on, on This Is Not A Burial. So it, it's just marvelous. I love casting so much and I love getting to know people in that way. And I love discovery and I love the privilege that comes with working with, you know, um, actors in their prime or actors that are living legends like Mary Twala Mshongo that was in Resurrection, so. I, yeah, I love we'll it. We'll talk about her in a minute, I hope. Um, I remember The Wound had a great international festival life, I think, but then was either banned for a while in South Africa or was threatened to be banned. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you actually got it seen there, how you worked through all of that? Sure. Um, I mean, this was a hell of a project to put together because domestically we really couldn't finance it because of how um, controversial people found it. And so um, took six years nearly to set up was a co-production between South Africa, Germany, the Netherlands and France. And um, it had a beautiful festival career, premiered at Sundance. Um, we won 28 international awards in the end. It got to the Oscars shortlist of nine. I'm convinced if I had more campaign money, like we would have won. Um, so it, it really surpassed, I think, any kind of expectation we ever had for it. And yeah, then we, I was so excited to bring it to local audiences. Um, and it was a shit show to put it to put it, you know in in short terms it it people had a very polarized intense um reaction to it and just for the benefit of of those who listen who aren't familiar the the film is a gay love story set within a ritual um of a ritual of going into manhood essentially initiation into manhood um, in the Isiklosa culture. And so it's not something you're supposed to talk about. It's not something that we're ever supposed to see. Um, and then you have a white director 
who everyone conveniently forgot that co-wrote this with two black men who had gone through the ritual themselves and one had written a novel about it um but that just threw people over the edge and the film and publications board which is the the entity which sort of determines age restrictions. I don't know how to say Yeah, your sort of censorship or rating, your ratings body. Ra yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, they were getting a lot of pressure from small factions of the public, i.e. toxic males, um, to, to give it a very harsh rating. And so when it had done festival runs and, and so on, in the event that it needed a rating, it had gotten a 16 rating. Um, but what had happened, and I'm really fast forwarding now, this is a very in-depth situation that happened, um, but essentially the only way they could ban it, because banning cinema is illegal in South Africa since the fall of apartheid, um, is to classify it as pornography, which they did. And so pornography cannot be shown publicly again if we'd had the money we totally would have distributed it via adult shops like a, via sex shops i think that would have been actually electrifying for our marketing campaign but we did not have the resources and things turned very quickly violent um the cast were getting death threats john were getting death threats um i was getting death threats elias was getting death threats and I think a lot of my friends were concerned because I had cast the film out of my house. A lot of people knew where I lived. People were showing up um, at my apartment building. And so a lot of the team left, understandably for, for safety reasons, left the country. And I remember to this day having a huge fight with Elias about it because I wouldn't go um he had his his first son was very little at the time just a couple months old and i remember he was furiously packing and you know while screaming at me because i'm like i'm staying um because i'm south african i plan to make south african films until i die and also i feel incredibly responsible to the cast and i i can't leave them in this situation so um the film was out of cinema for three weeks. The piracy was unbelievable, which, you know, I was low key thrilled about because I was like, people are getting to watch it. So yeah, it means people were desperate to see the film. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but we were in and out of court for a really long time to try and get um, the rating overturned because what had happened is we got an interdict and the rating was taken down to 18 but I was not satisfied with the 18 rating. I still found it problematic. And so I got this amazing law firm on board pro bono. And yeah, we were fighting for about six months um, with the film and publications board, our sort of ratings entity, as well as a lot of incredibly patriarchal sort of traditional groups who were lobbying for the film to be banned again. Um, and we got the film down to a 16, finally. Um, and then, you know, but by that time, everyone had kind of seen it through piracy. So the, the cinema run was incredibly compromised. Um, and then we were man we did manage to release on um, Showmax, a South African platform, um, subscription platform which was beautiful because so many people got to watch it in the safety of their homes because people were being attacked at the cinema for going to watch it. Um, I went to the the police after receiving hundreds of cyber threats and threats and I mean really detailed like how they would rape me how they would kill me. They know where I live, etc. Um, and I could not get a case number from the police, I went to four different police stations. Uh, and at one of the police stations, a colonel told me, you know, he was like, why are you here? What do you need? And I had this whole collage of of my death threats. And he was like, you deserve this. I don't know why you're you're here. And I was like, if if I as a privileged white person cannot get support from the police, what the fuck are my black queer kid actors supposed to do and seek support you know it's it's and protection it was just 
it was just wild, but um, it was also just incredibly reaffirming when we did get the rating down. And, and I went to one of our very few art house cinemas here, which to be honest, are frequented by like old white ladies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was completely packed with black kids under 25. Kids were sitting on the floor, like the cinema was beyond capacity. And I was like, this is why we made the film. Yeah. So I mean, on behalf of art and freedom of speech, thank you for that fight because it that is just incredible what you had to do, what you had to face, but also a reminder of why films like that are needed. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, right. it, is, it did come down to free speech for me at the end of the day. Um, and so that's why I felt, you know, over and above how much I feel for the film, but just, it, I was just like, it's 2017 and this is happening. Like, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> so it was really not an option to, to go on the, on the on the journey on the war path um yeah and you've mentioned elias a few times how did you and he meet when did you join uruku why was he the right partner in crime for you so we met probably 10 years ago um and just really hit it off at a market um and stayed in touch and he brought me on necktie youth to distribute it actually again put in a situation where i had no fucking idea what i was doing but he was like we don't have a distributor and um you know i'm doing a million other things like do you want to distribute the film and i was like sure okay whatever that means um and it turned out being really fun like i did a lot of like guerrilla distribution stuff like putting massive um posters on the side of the highway without any kind of clearance and and stuff like that um so we really sort of fell in love with each other over that experience and he we had the conversation about sort of cementing our work marriage on paper and i was like we need to make a film start to finish first to see if we can really do this um and baptism by fire i mean we made the wound together and, and our relationship <laughs> survived so yeah i i so yeah we started sort of working together 2014 and cemented things 2016. Um, yeah and you've mentioned it but it is one of the most striking pieces of cinema in the past decade and i'm talking about this is not a burial it's a resurrection um this is directed by Lemahang jeremiah Mosese from Lesotho, which not many films made there, or if any. Um, so can you tell us how you met Jeremiah? Uh, not Jeremiah, Lemahang Jeremiah. How, yes. What does he go by? Does he go by? It kind of depends his relationship with you, but I call him Jerry because he's like my brother. So we'll Okay, but he's your brother. How did you meet your new brother? And <laughs> what struck you about his cinematic vision? Because it is special. It really, it really is um, another incredibly significant experience in my life. And I know we're going to get to realness in a minute, but I met Jerry through realness. So at the time, because it's expanded into this whole other thing since then, but it was a screenwriter's residency that we started because of how the, the wound was made, actually, that we had taken part in every known lab workshop known to man i think at that point in the world um to get it made and really really benefited from that process but also we're very cognizant of the fact that we were always the only africans and i mean john and i are white and elias is brazilian so you know we started asking decisions uh, decision makers why this was the case because we knew that there was an appetite for African projects and they said they're just not arriving at the table cooked enough developed enough to be able to compete with the likes of Asia, India, South America, etc. So we wanted to create a space where African projects and African cinema could be nurtured. And that's how Realness was initially born as the screenwriter's residency. And Jerry applied and took part in our second year in 2017. So that's where I met him. We instantly hit it off. It felt like I had known him for decades, if not like centuries. And 
his project was one of my absolute favorites from the selection process. Um, I think because of mostly because of this incredible older female protagonist because I'm kind of obsessed with my grandmother and and so he and I both had a very similar reverence for our, our grandmothers and the beautiful thing with the residency is we get to know each other very intimately over six weeks we're all living in the same house and um, he approached us to produce after the residency and as you say not much cinema coming out of Lesotho people don't even know what Lesotho is or <laughs> where it is in the in the continent or how to pronounce it in my case or how to <laughs> pronounce it. you're fine Lesotho works as well um and uh I was like how am I going to finance this because there's no financial instruments in Lesotho I couldn't finance it as a South African production because Jerry was very, very, very adamant about the need to shoot it in Lesotho, which I'm a million percent respected and understood. And so enter Biennale College, which I had known about since very early in my career, actually, and always sort of fantasized about doing it. And this seemed like the perfect film to do Biennale College with. So we submitted and got in and got the money and made the film 450,000 euros um did you say 150 or yeah 150,000 euros yeah. and then this film was so acclaimed I mean were you surprised you knew it was going to be good yeah but were you surprised that people noticed how good it is and that it had such an international life I'm Honestly, I'm not surprised because it's like nothing anyone had ever seen. Um, and I knew that from the first cut, which, by the way, was five hours. Lemohang edited it. And yeah, that's a whole other conversation we'll have to have. But um, I mean, even when we were shooting and I was seeing the frames, I was like, oh, my God, this is just this is just visionary you know and and his voice is so important and so different and distinct um so i i i hoped of course that that it would be recognized in the way that i thought was was right um and fortunately it was it was a it was an incredible journey to to develop shoot and premiere within eight months um because our first showcase of the film is at venice um so it's not like a it's not a publicized section or anything like that um and we ended up going back into the edit sound design and grade after that screening um so the the final vision of the film is the one that that won at sundance um but yeah and then to have it as oscar the, the oscar entry was i knew that that's something that i really wanted for the film so yeah ah oh, just amazing piece of work and behind the scenes to hear more about it. And um, you're working with uh, Lemahang's next film, Chattering of Teeth. Yes. Can you tell us anything yet or when, when that might shoot? So Jeremiah, after Resurrection, has become somewhat of a celebrity. I mean, if you've seen what he looks like, it makes sense. He is fucking fabulous. Um, but he has been kept so busy with being on juries with he's done a number of art installations, he had an art installation at the eye museum in the Netherlands um, at another museum, which na the name has escaped me now in Berlin. Um, and he's also directing theatre and so it's been very difficult to sort of stay in the writing zone so we're still developing and writing furiously um but i would say we're we're a ways away from from the shoot and i'm i'm we're pushing to get to to the finance financeable draft so that i can start that work but he's still he's not so fabulous he still takes your calls of yeah. course come yeah, on like i said we're brother and sister yeah. i mean yeah, he would get so much shit if he didn't yeah. Yeah. um and what else do you have right now i mentioned this uh really cool short that was in berlin and that was sort of proof of concept for what could be a feature is that right yes that's right so um sandulela sanda is the filmmaker um she's a black queer woman south african and um the film mirror mirror is super fun it is we made it during covid 
And so Sandulela was really smart about how to do something um, safely and contained. And so we decided on a FaceTime call between friends. It's a character study more than anything else, which is how it moves into the proof of concept space. And essentially it's it's two very innocent 17 year olds trying to figure out how to masturbate for the first time um, by consulting each other, consulting Cosmo, consulting you know links on the internet, practicing their hand positions and so on. They're um, two young women. Two young women. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was a beautiful discovery. Our lead actress, first film ever, her trip to Berlin was her first international trip ever at the at the premiere. And um, yes, we are developing a feature film called Blackburn's Fast. And um, the characters from the short are, are going to be in the feature as well. And that's a really witty, irreverent high school coming out movie, essentially, um, which I'm really excited about. I'm developing two films at the moment that are not super depressing, which is weird for me. Um, <laughs> but also really, really exciting. I look forward to it. Well, I'll still see some depressing ones if they're great, but Absolutely. yeah, some non-depressing in the mix of is course. good. I think balance and, is good. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned before sort of how a few years ago, you know, there were certain kinds of voices being developed in Africa or certain kinds of people got the sort of green lights. Um, yeah. What do you think? how would you classify the sort of interest in African voices right now? I mean, it seems like people are opening up more, but are they only opening up to certain things or yeah. What's your perspective? Yeah. I think it's a very exciting time for, for African cinema or storytelling in general right now. I think the shift that has started to finally happen is that African storytellers are telling their stories on their own terms, which is really the ethos of, of realness and, and why the realness work is so important to us. Um, so I think that's really exciting. It's still a long way to go. I think there's still quite, people are kind of feeling risk averse when it comes to African content. I feel like series that, that are, exa for example, getting made in Latin America would never be greenlit here at this stage of where we are in the journey. Um, but I think a lot more respect and autonomy is being given over to the talent, which is, I mean, God, it only took us this long for, for that to happen. Um, and I think, you know, cinema in South Africa is, art house cinema in South Africa is is interesting. It's It's really not preferred if i can say it like that you know the whenever we have to do funding applications in this country we always have to talk about commercialability is that a word commercial ability? commercialism or something yeah. whatever yeah um is the film gonna make money sellability yes sellability exactly um which really frustrates me because for example when i was doing all the funding applications for for resurrection when i was trying things locally i was like this isn't going to make money but that's okay because that's not why we're making it um and so there isn't really a section <laughs> that my films sort of slide into easily so it is a challenge and it is why all of our films are co-produced and i'm so grateful for that because i really believe that it elevates the work um i have i probably gone way off your question now. no that was great and realness <laughs> is still going strong if people want more information they can go to realness.institute that's right um but yeah that, uh, any update on realness it's still it's still on. so realness started as like a drunken conversation and we now have um six active programs three are um content incubators two for series one for feature films and three are sort of capacity building professional leveling up programs um yeah it's our seventh year of the of um realness and we partner with netflix on a lab um our other series lab just got back from pitching in series mania which couldn't have gone better we got variety coverage on that everyone wants a piece of of those series that were pitched so 
it's just remarkable how how it has ballooned into this this other thing and um i have to give credit and love to to my co-conspirators which are elias and um our third partner marek mandefro for just how much we've managed to build in this very short time and i mean we have massive um ridiculous aspirations so hopefully the next time we talk it all you know the empire will will be even more um yeah significant Keep the ridiculous aspirations i think that's important <laughs> I always end by asking people uh, two questions. So one is, do you have any pet peeves that people do on set? Oh, yes. And maybe this is, you know, having a house with 20 teenagers in one toilet. You know, <laughs> uh, maybe it's something else. Um, I detest people who don't read the call sheet. Like it hurts me inside and wants me like causes me to want to physically harm them um lateness is another thing that in general I just I can't and um something that that also I, I struggle with on a more serious note is people who aren't like committing to the vision you know like a I often struggle with this there'll be one or two technical crew members who just you know are not are not realizing how sacred the space is and and how special what we're making is um that i really struggle with yeah, yeah. and what do you think and this could be a whole other hour what do you think people misunderstand about what a film producer really does <laughs> It's such a great question. And I think, as you say, it could be another hour just because there's so many different flavors of, of producers, you know, like everyone has their own approach. Some people love going on set. Some people don't touch set. Some people, you know, love the festivals. Other, people's, other people don't. Um, and I mean, I've called myself and have now become known as what I call a film doula because um, development is very important to me. Working with the writer director is very important to me. Um, I like to work with auteurs and, and people that really have something important or interesting to say. Um, and so it is, it's about me walking this journey with someone and helping the birth, them birth their baby, you know, and then I become I get to become mom slash cool auntie to the baby and see it all the way to to graduation. So, um, but people don't understand that we do everything. Like we're doing a little bit of everything, and um, the I don't think people underestimate how hard we fight, how hard we have to fight, and continue to fight for the work. Um, I mean, my my family certainly doesn't know what I do for a living. Um, I don't think they even watch my films. So it's uh, it's uh, but I I, res I have nothing but the utmost love and respect for my fellow producer because it takes a very special kind of person to do what we do. Um, and I think that is also misunderstood some sometimes. You know, like a it's not just about the money guys there's a there's a lot else going on um so yeah and thank you so thank you for this this platform that you've created and that you're focusing on on female producers i think it's you're doing the lord's work wendy oh. by giving us a, a platform the producers are doing the lord's work i'm trying to just learn a bit more about i mean it's <laughs> absolutely stunning hear more, hearing more about what you've done and what you do um Kate Pansagrau, you're a badass. I knew you would be. Um, thank you so much for talking to us. Good luck with all the challenging productions ahead, including some non-depressing ones. And thank you for producing the way that you produce. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Wendy.